Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I never meant to get wrapped up in a feud with my homeowners association. All I wanted was to live a quiet, peaceful life on my five acres of land out in the country. But I guess the homeowner association board members had different plans. It all started when I decided to build a small barn on my property. Nothing fancy, just a simple wooden structure to house some farming equipment and supplies. I checked the county building codes to make sure everything was up to standard. The permit office gave me the green light, so I started construction. A few days into the project, I got a knock on my door. Standing there was Barbara, the head of the homeowner association board. Right off the bat, she started lecturing me about how I failed to get approval from the homeowner association before starting construction. I calmly explained that I wasn't actually part of the homeowner association, so I didn't need their permission. Well, that set Barbara off. She insisted my property was under homeowner association jurisdiction, and I had violated their rules. I showed her my deed and survey map to prove my land wasn't part of the homeowner association. Barbara huffed and accused me of being difficult. She stormed off, saying I better tear down the barn or face consequences. I thought that would be the end of it. But boy, was I wrong. The very next day, a police cruiser pulled up to my property. Barbara had called the cops, claiming I was building illegal structures on homeowner association land. Thankfully, the officer was reasonable. After reviewing my paperwork, he agreed that my land fell outside the homeowner association boundaries. He even apologized for the trouble and said he'd have a word with Barbara about misusing police resources. Over the next few weeks, the homeowner association board kept finding new reasons to sick the cops on me. They said my dogs were a noise nuisance, that I was illegally dumping garbage when I was just cleaning up branches in my yard. Every time, the officers would arrive realize it was another nonsense call, and leave again shaking their heads. The petty complaints continued even after I finished my barn. The homeowner association said I couldn't park my truck in my own driveway because it was an eyesore. They tried to make me take down my new deer fence because it was ugly. No matter how many times I proved the homeowner association had zero authority over my property, they just wouldn't back off. The final straw came when I decided to install a flagpole and fly an American flag on my land. I thought a little patriotic spirit would bring some good vibes. Yeah, that didn't sit well with the homeowner association. Barbara came pounding on my door, ranting about how my flag violated homeowner association rules about lawn decorations. I refused to take it down. Next thing I knew, a police car was once again pulling up for another frivolous call. The officer said he was responding to a complaint about an unauthorized flagpole and unsafe flag display. I was fuming at this point. I told the cop, Officer, I've had it with these petty calls. I own this land free and clear. I never consented to joining this homeowner association. Tell them to quit wasting your department's time and resources. The officer was sympathetic and said he'd talk to the homeowner association board again. He also suggested I look into legal options to stop the harassment. I'd had enough of the homeowner association's nonsense. It was time to send a message that I wouldn't tolerate these antics anymore. I got in touch with a lawyer who helped me draft a cease and desist order for the homeowner association. The letter outlined all the ways they were overstepping their bounds. It emphasized that I was not an homeowner association member, and they had no jurisdiction over my property. The order made it clear that further harassment would result in legal action. I sent the notice by certified mail so I'd have proof it was received. For a few weeks, there was quiet. I hoped the homeowner association had finally got the message and would leave me be. But these kinds of people don't give up so easily. Sure enough, I caught wind that the homeowner association was reviewing their bylaws to find a loophole they could exploit. They were convinced there must be some technicality allowing them authority over my land. That's when I realized I had to go on the offensive if I wanted this nightmare to end. I contacted the county permitting office to lodge an official complaint against the homeowner association for harassment and abuse of power. I included documentation of all the bogus police calls and harassment I'd endured. The county launched an investigation and discovered the homeowner association was violating all kinds of ordinances. They were operating without proper permitting and oversight. They'd unlawfully annexed land beyond their boundaries, including portions of my property. The county hit the homeowner association board with sanctions, fines, and probation. Barbara was forced to resign as president. To top it all off, I sued the homeowner association for harassment and legal fees. My lawyer was confident we had an airtight case. Once the homeowner association got our lawsuit notice, they scrambled to settle out of court. They tried to offer me a measly $5,000, but I negotiated a $50,000 settlement to make up for the months of headaches. 
justice was served. The homeowner association is now under strict county oversight. Barbara and her power-hungry cronies are gone. My property value has actually gone up now that it's clearly outside homeowner association bounds. The police commended me for standing my ground against the homeowner association's ridiculous complaints. I'm glad I dug in my heels against the homeowner association. Some may say I won by stubbornness alone, but I prefer to think of it as strategic, malicious compliance. I used the homeowner association's own tactics against them until they imploded from the inside. It just goes to show, you don't have to take crap from obnoxious homeowner associations. With some perseverance and lawful pushback, the little guy can win. The next one is a pro-revenge story. When I, 25F, was three, my grandparents passed away. They set up a savings account in my name. The account was meant to be accessed by me when I was 21. At that point, it contained just over 300k. My grandparents left me a letter saying they would like me to share the money fairly with any other Smith-Jones children, meaning my full siblings. Dad's a Smith, Mum's a Jones. By fairly, they meant that they wanted me to assess the situation and judge for myself what was fair. I never had full siblings, but I have two half-brothers, Mac and Joe Smith, who are Dad and Stepmom's kids. Due to the specific wording my grandparents used, I legally never had to give Mac or Joe any money. However, I see Mac and Joe as my brothers, and as the money came from our grandparents, I felt that the fairest thing would be to assign each of us 100k, so we all got an equal-sized lump sum, and I figured that when Mac, the youngest, turned 21 and took his 100k, we could split any remaining money. When I turned 21, Dad suggested I buy a house with my 100k. I found a place I loved, but it was 130k, and I couldn't get a mortgage, so Dad said I should borrow 30k from the account. I did, figuring I could pay it back before my brothers turned 21, and I have been repaying it. The account should be at 208k right now, but due to me withdrawing and then repaying that money, it's at 195k, so I still owe 13k. Joe turned 21 recently, and as I was giving him his 100k, Joe noticed that there was less in the account than there should be. I explained and said I was going to put it all back before Mac, now 19, turns 21. Joe told Mac and both boys said I stole from them and owed them the full 13k back plus 3 grand of interest that they felt they would have gotten, and they wanted it all paid by this summer, which gave me less than 6 months to bring the account up to 211k. I said I'd do it, but over 2 years as planned. The boys then wrote up a contract to that effect. I went to sign it until I saw that it said six months to pay it all back. I wouldn't sign as we agreed on two years. They said I should figure it out as they were entitled to that money and would be seeking legal advice. Later that day I got an email, clearly written by them, saying that they intend to sue me for the 16k, plus whatever is currently in the account, and additional damages and emotional distress on top of that. At this point in time I'd given Joe about 50k of his 100k because he wanted it in installments, I responded that legally, they were never entitled to any of it, and given their attitudes, I'd say they've already received an amount I deem fair, so that 50k was all they were getting. I then got a barrage of texts, calls, and emails yelling at me for going back on our deal. I blocked them. They then took to social media, saying that I was trying to screw them out of their inheritance, and rallying our extended family into harassing me over this, and it mostly worked as a lot of people messaged me. However, I got a message from this guy called Chris Smith. Chris said he was 27 and claimed to be my half-brother. I had never met him before, but he sent me photos of him as a kid with our dad, grandparents, and me. He showed me that he also had an account with 150k in it, and a scan of a letter from our grandparents, saying this money was meant to be shared fairly among dad's illegitimate children. Chris also told me we have another half-sibling who is 18. He'd been looking for me for a while, but only found me when Dad shared Joe's post, which had me tagged. We checked with a solicitor to make sure, and as the boys are legitimate, they aren't entitled to anything in Chris's illegitimate kid fund. And as they are my half-siblings, they aren't entitled to anything in my Smith-Jones kids fund either. I sent the boys a letter formally telling them to back off, stop posting about me online, and enjoy the 50k because it's all they're getting. The day they received the letter, Chris got a PM from Dad asking if the boys can have some of Chris's fund. Chris also said no, and told Dad we'd met. I told Mac and Joe about Chris and our other half-sibling, with Chris's permission. So it looks like my grandparents, knowing about Chris before they passed, set up two funds. One for the kids Dad had with my mother, who was still his wife when they passed, and one for children born out of Dad's affairs, presumably to make sure no one tried to screw anyone else over out of hurt feelings. 
I'm getting a lot of crap, but holding firm on my decision. The boys have realized that I won't back down on this, and it sounds like I've caused a schism at their house, as Joe has all the money and no intention of sharing. So Mac is now feeling twice as screwed, plus stepmom apparently did not know about the other half-siblings, or that my half-sister was born after she and dad got married, and she's made dad move into a hotel. It sounds like dad is looking for a long-term living arrangement outside of the family home, because it looks like she is not letting him move back in. Dad is begging me to reconsider, but honestly I'm done with all of them except Chris and my sister. The next one is a petty revenge story. I was about 18 or 19 at the time and babysat our neighbor's three-year-old boy. He loved animals, it was the middle of spring, so nice and warm, so I decided to ask his mother if it would be fine to take him to a petting zoo in the city. Everybody was excited, me included, so we went. And we had a ton of fun, he got a large amount of animal feed so he could enjoy himself. Nothing was weird up until this point. Nobody was staring, and I felt it was pretty obvious that I wasn't in fact his mother, but rather than that just babysitting him. Now came the time the little guy needed to pee. Not a problem, I thought to myself, so I took him to the toilets. There was a large line in front of the women's bathroom, but since I had to accompany him, because he was to young T use the adult toilets himself, we couldn't just go to the men's bathroom, which was empty. I figured waiting in line for a minute or two was not going to be an issue, though. Enter Karen. K. Hi, um, excuse me? She tapped me on the shoulder. Me. Yes? I thought since she had a little girl with her, she might just wanted to ask to skip ahead in the lane because her little girl needed to pee badly. K. Is this your child? Me. Oh no, this is my neighbor's child. I'm just babysitting today. K. Why the duck are you taking him to the bathroom then? She got very aggressive straight away. Me. Excuse me? He needs to use the restroom and is clearly too young to do so by himself. So obviously I'm accompanying him? What am I supposed to do? Let him just pee his pants? K. This is highly inappropriate. Only his parents should accompany him to the restroom. He is a boy and on top of that not even your child. God knows what you might do in there with him. Okay, so now I was getting kind of pissed. At that point in my life I had dealt with a lot of bullcrap from people since I was a nurse and people in the hospital tend to be entitled as hell when they don't get their way. I was absolutely capable of defending myself with words, and I already lost my temper with her being so rude. So I said, very loudly, You think I would look at his penis in there? You, what the hell, why do you have to make a bathroom trip with a small child sexual? Do you think about that when you take your girl to the bathroom? Oh my god, would you do stuff to your girl? Oh, that is disgusting. Why would you even think about something sexual when thinking about a little boy going to the bathroom? Now I said all of these things kind of very sarcastically, as it was just meant to scare her off. But obviously, I said it loud enough for a lot of people to hear. Now everybody looked at her disgusted and whispered, or even chimed in with me to tell her thinking stuff like that was disgusting, and that she should leave me alone. She looked mortified at this point, and just backed away and left. Moral of the story, please let people take children to the bathroom peacefully, because I couldn't have just let that poor boy pee his pants. The next one is a malicious compliance story, so for a little context, this story is not mine. This happened to my father in the 80s and the 90s, but I will write in the first person because English is hard. In the 80s, I lost everything I could. I dropped out of college, my father died of a heart attack, and my mother was somewhere in the wind. I wasn't worth the air I was breathing. As a last effort, I saved up some money to move to a different state so that I could start fresh. I chose Montana to be my new home. Because I didn't have a college degree, I knew I could only make a living with my hands, and not my head. After a bit of looking around, I found work on a ranch. The owner of the ranch, let's call him Jack, took me under his wing. He taught me how to ride a horse, how to herd, how to do cutting, roping, and many other useful skills on a ranch. My goal was to have enough money for a deposit so I could buy a house, or at least some land. After about three years, I had the money, but I loved the ranch and the folks so much that I chose to stay longer. In the spring of 88, I finally made the decision to quit. I was fully honest with Jack about what my intentions were. I told him that I wanted to buy some land to have a ranch of my own and potentially get married and start a family. Being the absolute champ, Jack offered me some contacts of people who were selling land. After some time, I chose a piece of land near Jack's ranch. I got a loan, bought the land, and in the summer I started building my house. By winter, the house was done, and it was planned that in the spring, I'll build a barn and some fences, corrals, among others. In the spring, it was back to work, and before summer started, I had nothing to do. I had a lot of time on my hands while I was waiting for all the paperwork to be done. 
and I wasn't going to spend two weeks sitting on my porch doing nothing when Jack promised me that if I would ever need it, he would give me a job. Now, I didn't need a job because of money, but I just didn't have anything to do. So I went to my good old friend Jack if he needed some help. He said that he could use me to guide people on the tours he was offering. His ranch is not only in the cattle business, he also offers tours of the pristine nature on his property. I happily accepted the job despite me not liking people. But still, it was better than just sitting on my front porch and doing nothing. The first few days went without a problem. But then, a wild Karen appeared to brighten up the day. I was just returning from a tour when I saw this Karen in the middle of the field yelling at this girl, who was also a guide. I didn't know the girl, but in my books, whoever makes a girl cry is an a-hole. I came over to them, and in the most passive-aggressive voice I can, I say, Good day, what seems to be the problem? and the Karen's wrath was now aimed at me, and she yelled back, This idiot has no respect for the desires of the customer. Give me a manager now. Now I didn't expect such strong wording, but I kept my cool despite my hot-headedness, and I came up to the girl, who's now sobbing because this Karen was mouthing off to her pretty good, and I say to her, Leave her to me. I'll take care of her. You go take a break and tell Jack that I'll be with this piece of work. She gives me a grateful smile and a nod and rides away. I go to the Karen and I say to her, Ma'am, I can't get you the manager as he's busy right now, but if you want, I can be your guide in her stead for the remainder of the tour. She replies very politely by saying, Sure, I think even the trees will be better than that B asterisk tetch. Every part of my hot-headed self wants me to pretty much bury this woman right then and there, but I keep my cool, and we head off on the tour. And within the first minute, what a piece of work she truly is. She behaves like she knows best, and everyone is lesser than her, and everything should be given to her. When we are about to turn around and go back, I give her a choice. We could either go the official route, or we could return by the unofficial route, which is shorter, but there were bear sightings reported in the past few days. I tell her that the unofficial route is quite dangerous, but just as I wanted her to do so, she vehemently objects because she is the wisest person alive and knows the best. Great, my trap had worked. After about five miles on this unofficial route, she starts screaming and turns so pale that she is even more white than paper. In the distance, there is a grizzly. I knew about the danger I dragged both of us into, but in the end, it was technically her choice to go that route. I tell her to make herself as big and loud as she can. I follow suit, but the bear keeps getting closer. It keeps growling at us. With every growl, Karen was getting ever more pale. After it gets way too dangerous, I shoot a round out of my rifle and the bear gets scared and runs away into the woods. The entire ride back, she keeps yelling at me that I put her intentionally in so much danger. And yes, I'll admit, it was quite reckless taking a visitor into a part of the woods where there were bear sightings reported, but technically she made the decision to go that route. I stay silent the entire ride because I can't keep a straight face. I was laughing maniacally in my head, and I knew that if I looked at her, I would start laughing out loud. When we returned, she was shaking violently and was pale as ever. After I tied up her horse, she demanded that I get her the manager, and I gladly point her to the little building in the distance, and she storms off. She starts yelling at Jack, and I can see that Jack is trying his hardest not to break out laughing. I could hear that she was demanding that I be fired, but the neat part was, I wasn't an employee of Jack's. I was doing it as a favor for a friend, and thus I couldn't be fired. After the Karen's tirade ends, Jack comes to me laughing like a kid, and he asks me, How did you even come up with that, OP? I start giggling as well, and answer, Well, she made the girl cry, so I wanted to give her special treatment. I heard of the bear sightings, and it worked out well in my favor. He then asks me not to do that again, as it was reckless. And I agree, and I tell Jack, I don't plan on doing it again, but I had a plan if the bear mauled the damn wretch. My defense would be that I gave her the choice to go on a safer path but because she was apparently of higher intellect than me, I simply agreed. Jack gives me a smile and heads off. <laughs> Years later, my father would end up meeting that girl guide again. Her name was Abby, but nowadays I simply call her mom. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.